So today we're going to prove eventually the goldreich levin theorem, which I mentioned last time. It's an algorithm uh, that, given query access to an unknown Boolean function, can actually find all of its large Fourier coefficients, despite there being potentially two to the n uh, candidates. Uh, well, first we'll start out by talking about a basic uh, technical kind of topic, which is that of restrictions. So it's a very simple concept. Uh, restriction just means, you know, given a function, fixing some of the input bits and getting a subfunction. Just fixing some input bits to either plus or minus one. So for example, if you have the majority function on five inputs and then you fix, let's say, x4 to be one and x5 to be minus one, then those kind of cancel each other out and the restricted function is on the first three bits, it's majority of those three. And if you further restricted, I don't know, x3 to be one, then you'd get the function on two bits, which is always one unless both inputs were minus one. Okay, I said that in words. We'll do an example with this function in a second if you didn't get it. Uh, so the picture in restrictions is, let's say we have some function on n bits, and let j be some subset of the coordinates. And we're going to think of uh, fixing the bits outside of j. So we'll also let j bar just be the complement. Uh, so as I said, we'll be thinking of uh, j as the domain of the new function, so we're fixing bits in j bar. So let z be any setting of the bits in j bar. And we're going to use this notation. So this is notation. It's a bit cumbersome, but you need to denote a number of things. So write f sub j bar z for the restricted function that you get when you plug in z to the j bar bits. So the restricted function is just a function of the bits in j now. So this is the restricted sum function. All right, and the notation here, just to remind you, this, this thing will always be the the domain of the new function. And this is the bits you're fixing. Okay, so sort of in a picture, I don't know if this picture will like help or hurt, but somehow if you can imagine the n coordinates lined up in a row, coordinate one, two, three, up to n, um, you're partitioning them into two sets. Maybe j is this set of coordinates and j bar is the rest. And you're fixing some substring here, z for the j bar coordinates, and then it's a function of the remaining bits. So they don't need to like, actually be contiguous, like j is the first so many and j bar is the rest. They could be in any, uh, any partition. And we're going to actually abuse notation a little bit here. Once j is sort of fixed, if y is furthermore like an input to the restricted function, oops, so this is setting the bits in the j coordinates, mm, we'll write like y comma z for the composite string. over the whole original domain. So you don't literally like concatenate y with z, but like the bits go into the right place, like the bits of y go into j and the bits of z go into j bar. Okay, so you have to remember, the substrings kind of remember what, what coordinates they're on. Uh, does that make sense? Okay. So let's do an example to make sure we all have it. So here's like a, an outstanding function I wrote down, it's kind of randomly. So it's a function on four coordinates, I call the g, and it's plus or minus one, and it's one if the bits are in assorted in ascending or descending order, or if x3 and x4 are both one. So there's no meaning to this, I've just cooked it up as something that is a mildly complicated function on four bits. And I actually worked out the Fourier expansion, and there it is in all its glory. 
Okay, so you, you can check that uh, this actually computes this function. Okay, so just, it's actually going to be worth our while to look at a concrete example like this. So let's imagine the restriction. Let's imagine that, uh, let's imagine that things are lined up like in this picture and that J is, the set J is actually coordinates 1 and 2. And let's say that Z is 1 and minus 1. So let's just say we're fixing uh, X3 to be 1 and X4 to be minus 1. Okay, so theoretically under our notation, we would call the subfunction G, and then the new domain is the first and second coordinates, and we restrict it with 1 and minus 1. Okay, and this is a function from minus 1, 1 to the 2 into minus 1, 1. And uh, this notation is good in theory, but it's too cumbersome for me right now. So let me call this also just G prime. Okay, it's a function on two bits. So uh, can somebody just say in words what this function of two bits is? Correct. Correct uh, definition. A definition of G prime is that G prime of x1, x2 is 1 uh, if and only if x1 equals x2 equals 1. I think that's right. That's what you said. Yeah, because, uh, you know, this condition does not hold. So we're checking these two conditions. And once x3 is 1 and x4 is minus 1, this is the only one that can hold. And then it only holds if they're both 1. Okay, so this is a simple function we're kind of familiar with. It's the min function on two bits, or logical or, according to our conventions. Okay, great. Now, uh, the thing we'll study for the first part of the class is, how can you know what the Fourier expansion of the restricted function is in terms of the Fourier expansion of the original function? Um, Okay, so if I said to you, uh, okay, we sort of figured out what this function was in our own words, and then we could take its Fourier expansion, but if we didn't do that step, and I just said to you, here's the Fourier expansion of the original function, and now I want to restrict x3 to be 1 and x4 to be minus 1, how do you get the Fourier expansion of the restricted function? Yeah, exactly. You just plug like the restriction in. You just like plug in x3 equals 1 and x4 equals minus 1 and this will simplify. Okay, so I will not actually do that either because it's still a little bit complicated, but I assure you if you plug in x3 equals 1, x4 equals minus 1, you get a bunch of simplifications and you will eventually indeed get, uh, I'll have to check my notes, uh, you will indeed get uh, minus a half plus, I could have done this without my notes, half x1 plus a half x2 plus a half x1 x2, which is indeed the Fourier expansion of this function. Okay, that will happen. Uh, but I'm going to actually continue to belabor the point. Uh, suppose I wanted to check this, or let me just say, suppose I was actually going to start literally plugging in x3 equals 1 and x4 equals minus 1 into that thing and seeing what happens. Let me just confirm that you indeed get a coefficient of uh, plus 1 half on x1. Okay, so let's just do that. Let's just double check that that is correct. So, let's see, the coefficient on x2 will be, well, where do I have to look over here? I mean, I'm plugging in x3 equals 1 and x4 equals minus 1. So, like, this is irrelevant. This is irrelevant. Uh, this is relevant, right? I mean, this is going to stick around. So, I get, like, plus 1 eighth. And then, uh, this is irrelevant. This is irrelevant. Stop me if I make a mistake. That's irrelevant. Okay, this is relevant, right? Because here, I'm going to plug in x3 equals 1, and this is going to turn into 1 eighth x1. So, I'll get another plus eighth. Oh, shoot. Wait, what? We're doing... <laughs> I thought we were doing... 
Let's do three eighths. Yeah. Oh yeah. Good. Wait. We're doing x1. Oh, I want to do x1. Sorry. I circled this and then I said let's do the coefficient on x2. That was a mistake. Okay, let's do x1. So the first should be a negative 1 eighth? Yes, the first should be a negative 1 /8. Was the next one okay? Good thing you were here. I was doing this to an empty room. What's that? Uh, the next thing that's relevant is this one, right? Okay, and then this one? So I get plus 3 eighths here, right? Because x4 I'm setting to be minus 1. I think there's only two more. Don't panic. Uh, irrelevant, irrelevant, uh, irrelevant, irrelevant, irrelevant. This one yeah. is relevant. So I'm going to get minus 1 eighth times minus 1 out of this. So plus an eighth. God, I hope this works. And this one is... Is that it? Wait, you skip I skipped one? Uh, are we done? Oh yeah, we're done. That's it. <laughs> yes, we're done. Which is a half? This is five halves minus one, five eighths minus one eighth, four eighths. It's a half. Okay, good. Phew. All right, great. Now we're going to do it in general. Uh, good. So, uh, somebody can somebody say uh, in words what were like the relevant coefficients to look at here? in this little process, it was all the coefficients which contained x1 and j bar. Yeah, it's all the ones that contained like x1, not x2, and then some subset of like x3 and x4, right? Anywhere from empty to full. Okay, or if I wanted to, suppose I wanted to get the coefficient of g prime on the empty set, which, which terms would I have looked at over there? Yeah, things that don't contain x1 or x2 and then x3, some subset of x3 and x4. Or if I cared about g prime hat 1, 2, you know, I'd look at, you know, all the things that had x1, x2, and then sub subset of x3 and x4. Right, and then you have to add up them up with the coefficients and also with some sign, depending on how I was setting x3 and x4. Uh, good. So now let's do it in general. Say we care about f uh, with the j bar bit set to z and it's S for a coefficient. What are the relevant Fourier coefficients of F? Arda? S meaning J prime for every J prime containing J. Uh, close. E, but not quite right. You want Okay, here, by the way, here S is a subset of J, okay, because this is a function on the coordinates of J. So, yeah, so you definitely want to look at F hat, the stuff that has S, and then what else? For what T? A subset of J Yeah, you want to look at F hat S union T over all T's in J bar. Right? So the function is ultimately, the restrictive function is a function of these guys. And you're going to be setting these guys. So you want exactly the S monomial over here and anything over here will become relevant because you're going to fix everything here. Does that make sense? This is, this is actually going to be slightly tricky, but we're going to need it. So let's make sure we get it clearly. Okay. So if we were to do this process in general, we'd be looking at these coefficients and we'd sort of be adding them up with, um, well, either plus or minus, right? Because, you know, when you're looking at, in this example we did, when we looked at this thing, right, in this, our example, S was like 1 and J bar was 3, 4, so this was 
one relevant case, the case when t is equal to 3, 4 as well, we uh, multiplied this by minus 1 because we were fixing this to be 1 and this to be minus 1. So when we're adding these guys up in general, what will we multiply this by? If we're fixing t? Exactly. Chi sub t of z are like the product of the t bits of z. Uh, so what we want to say, and this is, I've proved this proposition kind of in words, is that um, this thing, f, the restriction to the j coordinates when we stick in z for the j bar coordinates, its s Fourier coefficient is going to be the sum over all of the relevant guys, which are sort of indexed by t, t a subset of j bar, of f hat s union t times z t. Okay, this is like you're going through all the relevant coordinates and then you also take the coefficient and you'll multiply it by the product of zi for i and t. Okay, this is key. I want to put a star on this. Any questions about it? Okay, another way to see it, this is the last amount of time I'll spend on this particular function. Another way to kind of see it is if, uh, once we've decided that, you know, we care about restrictions to uh, set j, and in this example, j was going to be 1, 2, you can kind of rewrite this where thinking of like x1 and x2 as the only variables and kind of thinking of x3 and x4 as constants that would go into the coefficients. So I might write this equivalently as, first I'll do all the stuff that does not involve x1 or x2 at all. So that's like 1 eighth, and then minus 1 eighth x3. I'm not going to do it all, but don't panic. 1 eighth x4, and then uh, there's also the 3, 4 term, this guy, plus 5 eighths x3, x4. And that sort of times like nothing. Uh, this is like the no x1 or x2 stuff, plus some stuff times x1, plus some stuff times x2, plus some stuff times x1, x2. So for example, this thing, the stuff times x1 is like negative 1 8 plus 3 8 x2 plus, uh, what did I do wrong? Oh yeah, sorry, you're right. 1 8 x3 minus 3 eighths x4 minus 1 eighth x3 x4. Okay, and similarly. Uh, good. And you can now imagine like if I plug in x3 equals 1 and x4 equals minus 1, you know, the restricted guy's Fourier expansion, it's got some number times x plus some number times x1, x2, and x1, x2, and I can plug in x3, x4 to get each of the coefficients here. Okay, and like, uh, for each set, each of the four sets S, each subset x1 of x1 and x2, like this computation is one of these four sums. Okay, I hope that's not uh, incredibly confusing. Okay, so now we're going to, if you're all nodding, we're going to take it up to the next level of difficulty, uh, which is the following. When you're doing restrictions or thinking about restrictions, a common thing that uh, you'll do is the set J that you're not fixing is you fix in advance, so you decide which bits you're going to fix and which bits are going to remain sort of free. And then you consider what happens to the restricted function as you vary the bits that you're fixing. Okay? Hang in there. It's not so bad. So a common scenario. This will be sort of given f and also j. And we're going to kind of consider how... I don't know, f, j, z, 
hat, how the Fourier expansion looks as you vary z in minus 1, 1 to the j bar. Okay, it's not going to be completely obvious why that's an interesting thing to do, but in the next couple of lectures, we'll do it. So let's uh, learn what we can about this scenario while we're here. OK. So now it gets slightly crazy. Uh, if we're going to do this, you can think of Okay, fix S. S, a subset of J. Now, you can think of the restricted function, its S Fourier coefficient as a function of Z. Okay, you could say, I'm really, I really care about the S Fourier coefficient of the restricted thing, maybe like S equals 1, 2. And I'm curious as to like how it varies when you vary what bits you're fixing for x3 and x4 in this case. So it's a function of those bits. And you could write it in a kind of crazy way as fj like dot s. It's a function from the j bar bits into the reals. OK, so this is the function which on input z, this function, it maps z to, uh, you know, well, f hat j bar z s. OK, so now I'm going to kind of blow your mind. I want to, this is a function on the bits in j bar. What are its Fourier coefficients? One can ask that. Yes, uh, Misha got it right, but uh, I'll do it slightly more slowly than that. Uh, OK, this already has like a hat and like a Fourier coefficient in it instead. So I'm just going to rephrase the question. Instead of asking what are its Fourier coefficients, I'll just ask what's its multilinear expansion. It's the same question, but it's less freaky that way. So question, what is the multilinear expansion of this function f j dot hat s do you understand the question this is some function that depends on z so it's a real value function it has a fourier expansion okay can somebody tell me what it is yeah, I think that's what Misha said as well. It's actually, it's right there on the board. It's already there. Uh, I mean, if you look at it, this is like a formula for this. And if you think of it as like in terms of z, it's exactly what we're looking for. You know, it's the sum. Remember, this is a function on j bar. So it's multilinear expansion is going to be like the sum over all monomials of variables from j bar, like the sum over all t of some number times that t monomial. OK, so yes, the answer is exactly, you know, proposition star. Does that make sense? It's kind of the most complicated thing we'll say today. OK, so uh, I asked this weirdo question only to get the answers to the following uh, two questions. Um, so again, you know, fix, given f, fix uh, some subset s of j. And let me ask you now, what is the average value of this Fourier coefficient when you average over all z's? In other words, what is the expected value over z, drawn from minus 1, 1 to the j bar of f 
J Z hat S. Okay, in other words, if I go over all ways of, in this example, picking x3 and x4 at random, like what will the average value or expected value of, let's say, if s is singleton set 1 in this case, the Fourier coefficient, what will it be? Joseph? Well, actually, um, uh, actually, let's look at, I mean, maybe it's, instead of going straight to the answer, let's look at this special case. Remember, this was the case where j was 1, 2, and we're interested in the Fourier coefficient on x1, so that's like s is 1. So if I, you know, take the expectation over all settings of x3 and x4, what's the expectation of this coefficient? Minus 1 over 8. Yeah, minus 1 over 8, all these things go away. Uh, and where did this minus one eighth come from? That's right. So it's, the answer is f hat s. And one way you can see that, let's say from the proposition, is this is a function where, okay, we have some function here, a function of z, and we want to know its expectation, its mean. So here's the Fourier expansion of the function. And if I give you the Fourier expansion of a function, the mean of that function is just the empty Fourier coefficient. Right? It's the coefficient on the empty monomial. So it's really just like whatever number you have here when t is the empty set. So it's f hat s. Or if you think about it, you know, it's kind of like you're going to fix x3 and x4 at random. And so some of like the monomials will like collapse onto x1. But no matter what the thing that's going to potentially collapse onto x1 is, if it's got some x3s and x4s in it, in expectation, it's equally likely to be plus or minus. So it'll be zero in expectation, and only the original coefficient will survive. Any question? OK, so now we come to the last uh, of this step of this craziness. Uh, so the exact thing we need for Goldreich-Levin. What is the expectation over z uniformly random from j bar of f, the s Fourier coefficient of the restricted function squared? So for this question, I recommend don't think about this picture. Think about the fact that you know the Fourier expansion or the multilinear expansion of this function as a function of z. Yeah? No. Example, no remember, this, this, this is an interesting point. This function is definitely a real valued function because its value is like a Fourier coefficient of the original, well, of, the, of a new function. So it's like a Fourier coefficient of like a Boolean function. So like this quantity here is unlikely to be plus or minus one. Is this some sort of variance? Um, kind of. Uh, there's so many like symbols in this that it's very hard to see through to the essence of it. But for example, suppose I asked you, hey, I have a certain function h of z, and I'm curious about uh, the expected value of h of z squared. Can you tell me this in terms of the Fourier coefficients of h? Right. Parseval says it's the sums of the squares of the Fourier coefficients. So that's exactly what's going on here. H is the function f j bar hat s. Okay. But we do know that guy's Fourier expansion. It's sitting right here. So what are the sums of the squares of this guy's Fourier coefficients? Isn't the Boolean function the negative one? Pardon me? Isn't that still a function that whose range is negative one and one? This guy? Yeah. No. This is the function that, given a setting of the j-bar bits, reports the s Fourier coefficient of the restricted function, which, you know, generally for Boolean-valued functions, which the restriction is, the Fourier coefficients are not plus or minus 1, unless it's like a, a parity function. 
yeah, it's just the sum of the squares of these things. So it's not like a super enlightening answer, but it's relatively um, short. It's this. It's sum over t, a subset of j bar, f hat s union t squared. Any questions? We just have, if you decipher all the notation, it's the expected square of some function, some real valued function. Parseval tells us that that's equal to the sum of the squares of that function's Fourier coefficients, or the coefficients in the multilinear expansion. And this is the multilinear expansion, and these are the coefficients. We're just taking the sum of them squared. OK. So these are actually important things eventually to know, but We've had enough for now, so please just like burn this formula into your memory because we're going to use it like uh, at the crucial final step with two minutes to go at the end of the class. <laughs> okay. Any questions before we change topics a little? Yeah, I don't necessarily expect you to like exactly remember this. Uh, I hope you remember like. The idea behind how you can get the Fourier coefficients of a restricted function, really, you should just remember it's like you take the Fourier expansion, you like imagine what happens when you actually plug in values for some of the bits. OK. Great. So let us change topics completely. And for the rest of the class, I'm going to talk about a theorem called Goldreich Levin theorem. So this was proved by Goldreich and Levin in 1989, and their motivation was cryptography. And indeed, this is kind of like if you take a theoretical crypto class, like in Crypto 101, it may be the very first theorem that you prove. And uh, Really, the full version of the theorem, I mean, that, uh, were what Goldreich and Levin were really doing, was something from cryptography. They're really showing that from a one-way permutation, uh, you can build a pseudo-random generator. So I will not define these terms. But uh, very briefly, like a one-way permutation is a Boolean functions with n inputs and n outputs, which is a permutation, like it's a bijection. And informally, it has the property that it's easy to compute, but the inverse function is hard to compute. Okay, and somehow it's like the most basic or almost the most basic assumption in theoretical cryptography that such objects exist. And the point of Goldreich Levin was to show that once you make that assumption that this object exists, then you can use it to build something called a pseudo random generator which is a more sort of powerful cryptographic object. Uh, basically, this is an object which it takes maybe some n inputs. Uh, it's like a function from n input bits to uh, s input bits, or s bits, where s is much bigger than n. So n bits to some much larger s bits, with the property that if you feed it a random n bit input, the resulting s bit output kind of looks random to any polynomial time algorithm. So some kind of object that can like take some amount of random bits, truly random bits, and stretch them to like uh, a larger number of pseudo random bits that are nevertheless good for cryptographic purposes. So like yeah, you can get like polynomially many more. Uh, you might even be able to get exponentially many more. I no. am embarrassed to say I don't know. Okay. No, oh yeah. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. In complexity theory, sometimes you study ones that go from logarithmic number of bits to linear. But in cryptography, uh, you should imagine that it's easy to compute. And therefore, it's computable in polynomial time. It can only even output poly many bits. Good. OK. Now, again, I, I won't get into it. Maybe I'll put some ideas about it on the exercises. But uh, how do they uh, do this? Well, oddly enough, they do it by um, constructing a learning kind of algorithm. I 
And why does that even make sense? Well, how do they prove that if the initial function is this kind of one-way permutation, that the resulting thing is a pseudorandom generator, the proof is always by contrapositive. And that means that like, if the object is not a good pseudorandom generator, then this thing was not a one-way permutation, which kind of means if you have some sort of algorithm that can um, sort of tell that these bits are not random, then you'll get an algorithm that can compute the inverse of this function. And so it's like an algorithmic reduction. Given one algorithm that can do something, you want to build an alg another algorithm that can do some more powerful seeming thing. What you need to do is do some sort of algorithmic reduction in the middle that like, transforms one algorithm to another. So the proof actually requires uh, constructing an algorithm. And this algorithm, if you view it in the right way, is like an algorithm that's highly useful for learning theory. And that fact was exploited by uh, some later guys, Kushilevitz and Mansour. OK, so that's a bit of uh, the colorful history. And maybe I'll explain it a little bit further on the homework. But let me just now turn to a statement, like a drier statement, of what the algorithmic problem that they solved was. OK, so here is the theorem. And I'll phrase it like a learning problem. So given query access to an unknown function, let's say Boolean valued, and also a parameter tau, Uh, in polynomial time, in the relevant parameters, namely n and 1 over tau, uh, you can output a collection, say script L, of subsets u of one through n, Fourier coefficients, basically. Uh, let me add with high probability here, but I'm kind of going to ignore this point, uh, with the following two properties. Basically, you want to say this collection will contain all the Fourier coefficients of f, which are at least tau in magnitude. Okay, so we'll have to say something slightly more annoying than that. Uh, we'll have the following two properties. Uh, if uh, you have a Fourier coefficient u which is bigger than tau, then u will be in this collection. So if you have a big Fourier coefficient, you'll be in there. And conversely, if you're, uh, if you're in there, then you'll be big, but not quite the same big. So uh, if u is in the set, the guarantee is that uh, the Fourier coefficient is at least tau over 2. OK, so we don't really want to set like a perfectly sh bright line, like above tau you're in, below tau you're out, because it's very hard to like estimate a Fourier coefficient exactly. But we don't really care that much for these factors of two. Basically, you know, if you're big, you're in. And if you're in, you're big for slightly different meanings of big. Um, that's the theorem. It's like an algorithmic statement. Uh, just as a small remark. It's, they're both implications. Yeah, that was the terrible use of a comma. <laughs> it's maximally bad use of a comma. Uh, OK, let me make a small remark. Can somebody tell me, I want to just reassure you that the output of this will not be too big. So can somebody give me an upper bound on the, assuming this theorem, the cardinality of the collection that's output? Kind of. Uh, kind of. I think you all, I think what you all meant to say was 4 over tau squared. Uh, because if you're in the set, uh, if you're in the collection, then in particular, I mean, that's equivalent to say this thing is equivalent to saying that f hat u squared is at least 
uh, tau squared over 4. And uh, we know that the sum of the squares of all the Fourier coefficients is 1, so if everything in the set is at least this big, then there can be at most the reciprocal as many. Okay, so that's the main theorem that we are going to prove by the end of the class. Uh, I want to like end the class on the proof, so I will go through a few corollaries of it just now. So at a high level, uh, remember last time we had this learning theorem that said if you somehow magically knew a collection of Fourier coefficients such that f had almost all its Fourier spectrum in that collection, then you could learn f very effectively, even just with random examples. And one thing you could try was just assuming that collection was all the low degree monomials, but it might not be the case. But this helps you find that collection. Okay. This just says if you also have query access, you can actually find all the big Fourier coefficients, um, which lets you kind of not worry about this step of how to find the large Fourier coefficients. Uh, so this corollary is due to Kusha Levitz and Mansour from 93. And it says this, let's see be a concept class such that uh, for every function f and c, uh, f is, let's say, epsilon over 4 concentrated, its spectrum is concentrated on some collection, on a collection of at most m coefficients. Okay, so suppose every function in your class has a pretty concentrated Fourier spectrum, then you can learn it with queries. So then C is learnable with queries to error epsilon in time polynomial and the relevant parameters namely n, m, and 1 over epsilon. It should be kind of almost clear how to do this, but not quite clear. Um, the only thing that's not totally clear is, uh, you know, this algorithm is good at finding the large coefficients, and the assumption is that sort of there's a modest size set such that once you get those coefficients, you're almost done. Uh, so let me put the details together on this board here. So this is a proof of the corollary. Um, so given f, it suffices to algorithmically find a collection uh, L such that F spectrum is epsilon over 2 concentrated on this collection L. Because remember last time we proved this theorem that says like once you know a, a set, a collection of Fourier coefficients where it's concentrated, you can actually estimate all those coefficients and you'll get a good hypothesis by taking the sign of the Fourier spectrum that you cook up. Uh, and what we know is there is some collection, uh, by hypothesis, there is some collection f of cardinality at most at m, such that f is epsilon over 4 concentrated on f. So we kind of want to approximately find this f. And the idea is just run this Goldreich-Levin algorithm with this parameter tau set to be epsilon over 4m. Okay? So the running time of this Goldreich-Levin algorithm is polynomial in n and 1 over tau, so the overall running time here is polynomial in m, n, and 1 over epsilon. So the running time is okay. So that gives us back some collection L. And I just want to argue that F's Fourier spectrum is concentrated on L. So let's just look at that. 
the sum over all s that are not in L of f hat s squared. I want this to be small. Uh, so I'll break it up as the sum over all s that are not in L and they're not in uh, f. And then the sum over all things that are not in L and they are in F. Okay. So first off, I claim this is all at most epsilon over two. Why is that? Oh, actually, even epsilon over four. Why is that? Yeah, because right here, this just even if I didn't have this, if you sum over all the stuff that's not an f, by definition, it's at most epsilon over four. And this stuff is at most well. Uh, the cardinality of s is at most capital M, so it's at most M times the maximum of any term in here. And by definition, if S is not in L, then uh, the cardinality, oh, I could have even made that square root. The cardinality of uh, uh, F hat U is less than tau over 2. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I guess I could have even made this square root. And then each of these would be at most epsilon for M. Yeah. Well, I'm getting a little muddled with the calculations, but you can make the things as small as you want, really. Okay, so again, you don't need to get too caught up on that, but it gives you this nice learning theory corollary, which again uh, transforms an algorithmic task. How do I learn this class of functions? to a totally analytic class. Like, all I need to do is prove that the functions have Fourier concentration somewhere on a, some modest size set. OK. And just so this does not look completely abstract, let me give you one specific application of it. Uh, that's a further corollary of this. If we look at this class of decision trees, all f computable by size at most s decision tree, this is learnable, again, with queries, query access to epsilon error in polynomial time, like really polynomial in n, S and 1 over epsilon. And how do I prove this? Uh, in the interest of time, I won't fully flesh out every single step. If I was more organized, I would have put some of this on the homework. Uh, the main uh, first step is to say that if you are a function computed by a size S decision tree, I claim that f is epsilon close to some h computable by low depth decision tree log s over epsilon depth decision tree okay i'll justify this in a second now if you remember last time low depth decision trees we saw they have a very nice fourier spectrum they're concentrated uh, things are very pleasant. So, in particular, the Fourier sparsity of a depth k decision tree was at most 4 to the k. So, this is at most 4 to this thing, log s over epsilon, which is s over epsilon squared. And now, uh, this actually was on your homework. We know that h is sort of maximally concentrated in a relatively small set of Fourier coefficients. It has all of its Fourier mass on this many Fourier coefficients. And f is close to h. 
you know, as a consequence from your homework, F is maybe order of epsilon concentrated on some S over epsilon squared coefficients. Okay, and that's exactly, exactly what you need to then run Kushlevitz Mansur and learn the thing. Uh, so the only thing I didn't justify here was point one. And I'll leave that as a little problem for you. Why, if you have a, a decision tree with S leaves, what you can do is just truncate all the paths at depth log s over epsilon. That gives you a new decision tree. That's the thing that's going to compute h. And basically, for a given path, the fraction of inputs which follow that uh, that follow such a path and get affected by the truncation is at most 2 to the minus this. That's the probability that a random input follows that path. That's like epsilon over s. And then you do a union bound over the s paths. So tree has size s. Okay, that was a little bit fast, but I'll let you do that as an exercise that I can uh, end on time. Okay, any questions at this point? So this Goldreich uh, 11 algorithm, which facilitates this algorithm, gives you a very nice uh, uh, way to do learning theory just by proving Fourier concentration for functions. Okay, so now I want to show you this algorithm. It's a very cool algorithm, very slick idea. So you've got query access to this function. And we even saw from last time that even if you just have random example access from the function, if I fix a Fourier coefficient, I can estimate you know, f hat that Fourier coefficient very easily. So like if you give me a u, I can compute, estimate f hat u efficiently you know, to within tau over 4 and decide if it's big or small. But there's 2 to the n of them. So, I mean, you can't do that for all 2 to the n of them. So how are you going to actually, like, find the big guys? Uh, well, the idea is to use uh, divide and conquer. In some sense. And uh, I'm going to give you the pseudocode of the algorithm right here. And there's going to be a couple of steps that will look mysterious. And filling those in will be the main challenge. Uh, so step zero is put all uh, subsets u in one uh, bucket. So as I go along, you'll get the gist of what bucket means. So all two to the n possible sets, I'm going to put them in a bucket, whatever that means. Uh, then I'm going to go into a loop. And uh, when in the loop, I'll just select any bucket I have, B, and I promise you that it will have 2 to the m sets in it for some integer m. Okay? Initially, when I have only one bucket, that m will be n. Uh, now, the next step is split this B into two buckets called B1 and B2. I'll eventually say what this means, but this bucket contains a bunch of subsets or potential Fourier coefficients, and you're going to split it into two, each with 2 to the m minus 1 sets. Okay. And this is really the key step, C. You should uh, weigh both of these buckets. And what that means is estimate the Fourier weight of all the sets in the bucket. OK? 
Okay, and the main step is explaining what B and C mean, but let's assume that you could do this. For each of the, these sub-collections of Fourier coefficients, you can estimate how much Fourier mass is in there. And then D, uh, discard any bucket, I mean, namely B1 or B2, if the weight estimate is less than tau squared over 4. Uh, 2, sorry. Okay, and so uh, the algorithm will keep doing this, and then it, let's say it will end when all buckets have only one set in them. Okay, I mean, every bucket, you, I promise you, will always have a power of two, so at some point it'll get down to one. And when you're all down to singleton buckets, then you just output everything that you have left. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it all contains some index and don't contain some index. You'll get your, I guess you're quite uh, ahead of me, but yeah, we'll see that. Uh, yeah, let me just emphasize what this means is this bucket contains like some, I don't know, 1,024 subsets of 1 through n, and you're going to split it into two disjoint uh, guys, each containing 512. Okay, so these, these are like the mysterious steps, or even like the question of how do you maintain these buckets that are containing exponentially many objects, they're sort of maintained implicitly. But let me just try to argue the correctness of this algorithm, assuming we can do all the steps. Any questions at this point? It's a bit mysterious, but it should become a bit clearer once we do this proof of correctness. So let's prove, assuming we can do it, uh, let's do a proof of correctness. Um, let's do this proof even assuming all these estimates that you do in step uh, C are exact. Okay, the algorithm eventually is going to only make accurate estimates, but let's just assume they're exact for now. So, uh, well, the thing we really have to prove is these two bullet points. Okay, so let's look, take them one at a time. For like bullet points, okay, let me call this I, this two. Okay, so for bullet point one, suppose that U is such that F hat U is at least tau. Okay, so imagine u is some Fourier coefficient that actually is big. Uh, what I claim is that it will stick around all the way to the end. Uh, I claim is that it's never discarded. Because it doesn't matter who else is in its bucket as time progresses, any bucket that it's in will always be getting at least tau squared. Right? Its bucket is always it's always at least tau squared, so assuming the ex estimates are exact, you'll never discard it. So it's just going to stick around for the entire algorithm. Right? Okay, and let's check uh, number two. Uh, suppose, on the other hand, you're a small guy. Uh, F hat u is smaller than tau over two then uh, it can't stick around to the end. This U can't remain till the end. Right? Because it could stick around and stick around, but, I mean, you know, for it to remain in the end, it must have been in some bucket of size 2, and then that got split into two singletons, but then when you weight it, it was a singleton, so its weight would be like tau squared over 4, okay? And you only keep the guys that are at least tau squared over 2. Okay, so eventually the singleton bucket would be 
containing it would be at most tau squared over 4. Okay, so that proves sort of the correctness, uh, assuming the estimates are exact. Yep? Do we have a way of weighing the targets other than just computing the individual Fourier coefficients? Yeah, that's, I'm presenting things in a weird order. Uh, that's a good question. I mean, uh, the naive way to do this is to, you know, you have a bunch of Fourier coefficients in the bucket. We know you can estimate a Fourier coefficient more or less, so you could just estimate them all. The trouble with doing that is that, you know, the buckets, especially the first one, have like two to the n things in them. So that'll take a, a tremendous amount of time. But yes, the key point will be that there'll be some like magic trick that will let us uh, get a good estimate for this weight, like efficiently. Okay, everybody happy with the correctness? Now let me make a couple of additional observations. Uh, first, the correctness is still okay, assuming the estimates are more or less correct. So correct to within, I don't know, plus or minus tau squared over 4 or 8 or something, right? Because actually in both of these facts that we used, uh, we had some margin of error, you know? Uh, it's tau squared or tau squared over 4, and we're, uh, the cutoff point was like tau squared over 2. So as long as our weights are within tau squared over 4, the correctness still holds. And furthermore, I want to also talk about the efficiency for a second. Again, forgetting this question, which will be the main point of how to do this weighing step and how to maintain the buckets in poly uh, efficient time, uh, I want to argue that the loop is only executed polynomially many times. So let's look for a second at the number of loop steps. Now, the first thing I want to say, I mean, uh, the number, if you imagine going through this loop, the number of active buckets is always not too big. It's always at most something. Can somebody tell me? Yeah, it's like something over tau squared, uh, maybe four over tau squared. Um, because if you look at this proof and look at our sort of correctness argument, uh, a bucket only sticks around if its weight estimate is at least tau squared over two. Okay, and maybe the estimate, maybe the true weight is a little bit off. You know, maybe we made a little bit of error, but any bucket that is sort of still active will have weight at least, let's say, tau squared over four in truth. Um, but the total weight is, you know, at most one. Some of the squares of all the Fourier coefficients is one, so that just, and the buckets contain disjoint guys, so there can be at most four over tau squared of them active at any one time. Uh, furthermore, you have this, like, splitting process, like, in each step, you make some sort of progress in that, like, a bucket that had two to the m guys before gets smaller. It gets into two buckets of size, two to the m minus one. And so if you think about, like, a bucket uh, can split, you know, at most, well, like, n times, okay? Because it could split and split and split and then get discarded. And in the worst case, it sort of splits n times. It gets down to a singleton. Uh, so I claim, and I don't want to fully uh, prove it, I guess, I hope you believe me. Uh, therefore, uh, the loop iterates at most uh, 4 over tau squared times n times. Because you can have, ever only have this many active buckets, and each one, like, splits at most n times. Actually, to be 100% honest, I could not think of a really succinct way to, like, very, like, in one sentence, clearly explain why this is true, even though it seemed, like, obvious to me. Can anybody, like, say, like, super succinctly why that's definitely correct? I guess you can only imagine, like, a tree and, like, it has a depth at most n. 
Yeah, I think even if you're not, you can imagine it as a tree, and at each step you like add a leaf, and the depth is at most n, but like the size, the number of leaves is always at most this. So, well, I think we all agree that it's true. <laughs> Maybe I'll go home and really try to think of that succinct sentence, but uh, I think that's true. A bucket doesn't really maintain its identity, <laughs> so to speak, yeah. I guess you could say that if, yeah, any bucket, so take, uh, stop at any point of time and take the bucket. Yeah. Now, any bucket that a particular bucket has been in could not have been fit at more than that time. That could easily just disappear, right? Yeah. Any, bu any yeah. bucket, like, I think it's reason at the end, if you look at all the buckets that are left, plus all the buckets that are on the discard pile, each one of those buckets was involved in it. Right. Yeah. You can think of a sort of bucket. If you think of the bucket tree, then yeah. it has depth to n, and each layer has at most four over tau squared things in it. So yeah. So in particular, yeah, if you want to get, yeah, actually, that does it, I think. Yeah. OK, good. So we all agree. That's good. All right. So uh, this is kind of cool in that, like, now we're all done, except for this, like, uh, these sort of mystery steps especially this one, what does it mean? But if we can do that step efficiently, like poly n 1 over tau time, then the whole thing is correct in poly n over tau time. OK, so uh, great, we're going to do it. It's not that hard. OK, I, yeah, I'm cheating a little bit because uh, we're going to do like B and C with high probability. I mean, our estimates will be correct with high probability, but it's like a very standard, like, kinds of arguments to take care of that. You just need to make the confidence with which you get like a good estimate in this weighing step like so small that you can like union bound over all the iterations of the loop. I'm going to forget about that. Um, okay, so uh, the remaining question is how to do B and C. Okay, so now I'll actually tell you what these buckets mean, or how we'll make the buckets. So uh, a typical bucket that we'll have in our hands, uh, I'll write it like this, B sub K S, where uh, K is going to be an integer between 0 and N, this is a little tricky, and S is a subset of the numbers 1 through K. So this is kind of, I think, what Arda was going for there. Uh, and the definition of this bucket is it's the collection of all uh, sets S union T, where T is a subset of the complement of K, namely K plus 1 through N. OK, so like. Uh, for example, what is the cardinality? Can somebody tell me the cardinality of B sub K S? I.e., how many Fourier coefficients or sets are in this bucket? Two to the n minus K. To the n minus K yeah, because you have one for each subset of the complement of K. Okay, so just to like, I don't know if this is a good idea or a bad idea, but to spell it out, if like K is five and S is like, uh, I don't know. 1, 2, 4, then this will be like everything that's like 1, 2, 4, plus like a subset of, what's a union, a subset of 6 through n. It's probably not proper math notation. Um, let me do two. Uh, Boundary cases, the edge cases are important here. So B, 0, uh, well, if K is 0, then this is the empty set. So S has to be the empty set. Uh, and what set is this? What collection is this? Yeah, it's everything. This is all subsets of N. And this is indeed like our initial bucket.
Okay, and uh, the last kinds of sets, B, uh, N, well, here, S can be any subset of 1 through N, and in particular, this will be what? Yeah, it'll just be the singleton set S, like it's a collection of one thing, namely S. And these will be like our final buckets, okay? These are sets will look like this in the end. Okay, and what I mean when I say like put them in here or like split them, you're just remembering like the names of the buckets, right? Which implicitly, these are the names, it implicitly tells you what guys are in them. And let me tell you the, the splitting operation. Splitting operation just like takes some B sub K and like shifts K up to K plus one. Okay, so uh, the split in part B here is like you go from B K S to like two things of the form B K plus one something. Uh, and in particular, you need to, you now you get to, since you're going up to k plus 1, you can either include the k plus 1 into s or not. Okay, so you go to either s or s union k plus 1. Okay, and this indeed splits it into exactly two. There's 2 to the n minus k here, and these each have 2 to the n minus k minus 1. Okay, so it's hopefully now clear what like step zero and A and B mean, and the two, and what remains is C. Okay. Okay, so now we have to do C, which means for C, we need to be able to estimate, well, this quantity, which is the sum, let's say for B, K, S, sum over all U, well, this is the definition, so let me just, you could really say sum over all T, a subset of K, bar um, f hat s union t squared. That's the weight of the sets in B in this bucket. Okay, so now it's all burned into your mind. What is this equal to? We burned it into your mind uh, 40 minutes ago. Yeah, good. Something, yeah, I'll write it. <laughs> it's expectation. The picture is like, I'm looking at, this is F, I'm looking at restriction where I'm going to fix the bits in K bar and look at the Fourier coefficient on S here and squared in expectation. So it's expectation over Z in minus 1, 1 to the complement of 1 through K. F restricted to the coordinates 1 through K where I stick in z for the remaining coordinates, hat s squared. That was the formula. Great. Uh, so I just, you know, it remains to explain to you that I can indeed accurately estimate this efficiently, or equivalently accurately estimate that guy efficiently. So can somebody like hack their way through all the symbols there and kind of intuitively explain why I can do this or how to do this? Estimate it empirically? Yeah, good. Yeah, uh, yeah, both of those things. So um, I'm trying to estimate some quantity which is an expectation over Z of something. And like this thing is, you know, between minus one and one. So it's a nice bounded random variable. So if I could just sample from this random variable, I could take the empirical expectation over, I don't know, if I want accuracy plus or minus tau squared over four with high confidence, I'll need to take something like, I don't know, one over tau to the fourth 
samples of this guy and take the empirical average and that'll give me a good estimate. So it basically comes down to can I, can I compute this for any given z of my choice? Because uh, I'll just pick a bunch of z's at random and then try to compute it and average it. And in fact, I don't even really need to compute it. It's enough for me to also estimate it very closely. Um, I don't know, to within, let's say again, plus or minus tau squared over 8 or 10 or something. Okay. If I'm only shooting for this error overall, it's enough to do this. Um, okay. I'm doing this slightly sketchy. There's a way to do it that makes it a little bit more uh, clear, but what am I trying to compute? I'm trying to compute the square of some number really closely. So it suffices to be able to compute, let's say estimate very closely, you know, the non-squared thing, f, k, uh, restricted by z, f, s, for, you know, any s of my choice and z of my choice. Right, I'll get a really close estimate to this. I, like, square that estimate, and it'll still be really close to the square of the true thing. Okay, so now can somebody say in words why I can estimate this? Yeah. Uh, there's one catch, though. I'm trying to estimate the... In the last class, we said that if you have a function and you have, like, a Fourier coefficient of that function, you can estimate that. In fact, you don't even need queries. You can just estimate it from a bunch of random examples. But actually, to do this, I do need the queries. Why? Have no guarantee that Z will be set. Yeah, like, if I had, as a learner, if the learner had access to the restricted function, F restricted by Z, even random example access, you could just estimate this empirically like we did last class. Now, I mean, but strictly speaking, you just have access to F, okay? But if you have query access, that's okay. Then even if Z is like some half of the bits, like if K is N over 2, and you want to be able to get samples of the form, you know, I want to pick a random string y for the first half of the bits, but like this z I've fixed to like 1, minus 1, minus 1, 1, whatever. You can still get access to the values of the restricted function using queries. Okay? If you just had random example access to f, you couldn't do this because if you really wanted to know f's value on some string of this form, you have to wait around a really long time before, like, the random example gave you something that had exactly this substring in the second half. But if you have queries, you can just query whatever you want. So you can just, like, pick random values for y and always plug in the values of your choice for z. Can I potentially okay, one question. Is over z also? Yes. Yes. Uh, it doesn't necessarily seem bad, you're saying, because you're actually varying over z, uh, or going randomly over z. Uh, but what you really need here is something like an expectation over z. This, I'm going to do this not properly, but you're doing expectation over z of the square of something, a Fourier coefficient. And that itself is like the expectation over y of the restricted function at uh, y times y s uh, squared. So I could square this by like doing another independent copy. Uh, 
So it's really like you're doing expectation over z, y, and y prime of like f of y, z times y, s times f of y prime z times y prime s. I don't know if I'm going too fast here, but uh, you would need to compute this empirically. And the trouble is here, you need to know f's values on two strings where even though z is random, it's like the same random second half in both cases. So it's very unlikely if you just have random example access that you get two strings where, let's say, the second half of the string is the same in both cases. So you really do essentially need queries. Uh, but if you follow this calculation, you can also see the correctness here. This is just like a bounded random variable that's between plus or minus one that you can sample from with queries. So you can just directly do churn off on this as well. Okay, that's the end of uh, Goldreich 11. Any more questions? Okay, see you next time.